Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining the New America Fellows Program for this discussion of Andrea Elliott's book, Invisible Child, Poverty, Survival, and Hope in an American City. I'm Brian Goldstone. I'm a class of 2021 New America National Fellow. And uh, before we start, just wanted to mention a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them uh, in the second half of the event. And most importantly, copies of Andrea's book, Invisible Child, are available for purchase through our book selling partner, Solid State Books. And you can find the link to buy the book on this page. Just click buy the book. And I very much encourage you to do that. Um, if nothing else comes out of this event, hopefully you will push that button that says buy the book. Um, so just want to quickly uh, introduce Andrea. Um, Andrea Elliott, who was a class of 2016 fellow, uh, is an investigative reporter for the New York Times and a former staff writer at the Miami Herald. Her reporting has been awarded a Pulitzer Prize, a George Polk Award, a Scripps Howard Award, and prizes from the Overseas Press Club and the American Society of News Editors. She has served as an Emerson Collective Fellow at New America, a visiting journalist at the Russell Sage Foundation, and she was a visiting scholar at the Columbia Population Research Center. And she's also a recipient of the Whiting Foundation grant. Uh, in 2015, she received Columbia University's Medal for Excellence. She lives in New York City, and this is her first book. So Andrea, um, it's good to see you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this with me. I'm so excited to talk to you about it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so for the people joining us who may not already know, um, the genesis of this book was a series of articles that appeared in 2013 over five consecutive days on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, the series focused on a young girl named Dasani, who along with her parents and seven siblings was living in <laughs> abysmal conditions at a family homeless shelter in Fort Greene uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, I was actually living in New York at the time when, when that series was published. And I remember that for a while, pretty much every person I knew in the city uh, seemed to be talking about this incredibly heart-wrenching and infuriating portrait of child homelessness in the richest city, in the richest country in the world. And I don't know if it was intended this way, but the series was very much received, I think, as an expose, um, as a glimpse into a world and a space that had been intentionally kept hidden from public view. Um, and its impact on policy and city politics was absolutely huge and immediate, um, which, which you describe a bit in the book. Um, this book, which you went on to report for an astonishing, what, eight years, right? Eight years after the publication of that original series, um, yep. cont continuing to follow Dasani and her family. Um, the book seems to have a somewhat different aim and orientation. Um, in the books afterward, you observe that the word understand literally means to quote, stand in the midst of. And if I could just quote you real quick, you write, to understand does not mean that we have reached some ultimate truth. It means to my mind that we have experienced enough of something new, something formerly unseen to be provoked humbled, awakened, or even changed by it. If I did anything in my eight years with Dasani, you write, it was to stand in the midst of her life. Um, I'm wondering, just as a, as a way of opening this conversation, I'm wondering if you could talk about how this method, this standing in the midst of, uh, led to the book becoming what it ultimately did, and whether it produced in you, Andrea, um, a slightly different orientation and perhaps even a different hope in how Dasani's story would be received now? That's a great opening question. So much, so much to unpack there. Um, I wanna just start by saying that I am 
feeling just a great um, gratitude right now to be conversing with you um, in this forum with New America. Um, New America was home for this book. And, um, you know, being able to write this book, uh, it was its own sort of story of survival. I, I'd like to say that this book <laughs> survived. Uh, it's been nearly a decade now since I entered Asani's life. It, it survived in large part because of the community that um, I found at New America and the incredible support I got there. And, um, you know, he, that is such an interesting way in. So the book covers this much broader story than the series. Um, but the series was, of course, my way in. It was an expose because the public was prohibited from entering um, mm -hmm. Auburn Shelter. Mm -hmm. And so Dasani and her family became partners in documenting the conditions of their room and, and basically as, as assisting me in my reporting until Ruth Fremson, the photographer, and I were able to finally sneak in through the back. And we stayed undercover for uh, a year. Um, the, the story came out, but I do think, I think even back then, I wasn't after an expose, I was beginning what would become a very long process of immersion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's funny, maybe a year after that series ran, I, mean, I came to New York, to America, to New America to give a talk. And I remember saying in that talk, I looked it up, that I was starting to feel panicked because the more I immersed in Dasani's world and delved into the history of her family, the more I saw that, that this book is about, as I put it at the time, is about everything. Mm, mm -hmm, everything. Mm -hmm, yeah. And um, if I could go back to, uh, to that version of myself back in like, I think it was 2014, mm -hmm. I would say, it's you're you're on the right track. It's actually um, a good sign that you're overwhelmed and even that you're panicked, because it means that you're awake to the challenge. Mm -hmm. And the major thing is to just trust in the process. And the process was a process of constant surprise, and um, yes, overwhelm. Seeing that the labels assigned to Dasani in the very beginning, she was the homeless kid I wrote about or she was the one in five poor children growing up in America, mm -hmm. that those labels were so often used as a kind of destination in people's minds. Like that's what she is. That's the way that we describe her affliction. When in fact, those labels are just a door opening. Really what they are is they're an invitation to go way past that current plight and to look at the reasons that that plight exists, both in her own life and more broadly in her community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which then causes, so it's like layer upon layer continued to be sort of revealed to me. It was a series of revel revelations. And if I look at the arc of the book, you know, she went from one system DHS to another system child protection ACS to another system where her brother's now at Rikers facing a murder charge, DOC, Department of Corrections. Mm. This is the pipeline that we always talk about, we mm -hmm. hear about and we talk about. Yeah. She was living it in front of me and each, at each juncture, I was scrambling in real time to understand this new system that I was suddenly in. I thought, I, okay, DHS, I got, like I, I delved into and I studied very, very closely homeless policy and, um, and just the system in New York City in particular, which is so interesting, only to find that suddenly I was in this other huge system, which was ACS. Um, and so I think what I, you know, what I started to kind of like surrender to in that being in the midst of her, life was this I, this notion that I am here to learn. I'm a mm -hmm. student. And um, she's showing me the way every time. She's basically uh, constantly 
um, in real time, giving me what the story is uh, that needs to be told, if that makes any sense. And so, mm -hmm. it, but it often felt like this is never going to end. And in fact, I wrote three different endings, mm -hmm. and all three endings are in this book. They're just they they they're now sort of certain chapters ending, but oh, that's where I thought the book ended, uh, and uh, something else would happen. Uh, and then I thought it ended there, and then something else, and it it happened mm -hmm. at least three times. Interesting. Um, something I mentioned uh, before we started was just how what the experience of reading this book was was like for me personally. Um, it um, I I said that you know some books resonate with 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 you when you're reading it. Um, for me, this book exploded. It just kind of it 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 overwhelmed me in a way that I imagine the experience of of bearing witness and reporting and being in the midst of overwhelmed you um, and that you were able to transmit that sense of being in the midst of things. And, the, and the, you know, there's there's a certain sensation when you're reading an expose or an investigation of, of outrage, of, of wanting, you know, springing into action, that sort of thing. And of course, there are moments here, um, really important moments that that create that effect. And we'll we'll get into maybe some of those. Um, but um, but there was something more profound here, I think, um, which is, you know, you use the word everything it, to be in the, in the everything of a human life, um, a human life that is not reducible to the labels that are assigned to that life um, that are not re reducible to the statistics that illuminate and contextualize that life. It, there was something really, really profound, I think, about, about that, that kind of encounter that, that is staged here in the book. So um, I, you know, in I some so, ways- I so appreciate yeah. that, Brian. Yeah. That's yeah. just so, so much what I hoped would would emerge in the yeah. reading experience, because in the in the reporting experience, what I felt constantly was that as opposed to some reporting I've seen out there where suffering is the central focus, mm -hmm. it's the sort of like pulse of the story. And sometimes that's needed. I'm not going to discount that. Mm -hmm. but my favorite work um, especially when it's dealing with disadvantaged people, put suffering in the backdrop mm -hmm. because there's just, there's so much levity and joy and humor and mm -hmm. revelation mm -hmm. in being mm -hmm. with Asania and Chanel and Supreme sure. and many others in this book, Faith Hester, Paul Holmes. I mean, mm -hmm. I was, um, I think that that, so you you just said something about how you know these the sort of the you were getting at the, I think the monolithic um, view that some people have of um, the story being one thing. I, I think it's so important to hold these kind of seemingly contradictory truths, um, you know, in, in the story and mm -hmm. be able to see that there's 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 joy and suffering all at once. It's all mm -hmm. mixed in that this family is many things, right? Because every human, as you put it, the everything, and you're writing, um, you're following several families, homeless families, which by the way, I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine it. Like mm. what, what that, because one family was so overwhelming and so hard, yeah. um, but it is so essential to embrace all these other, these parts, right? That, that are, make it complex and confusing at times and um, and then just putting it on the page and seeing yeah. what it does in terms of narrative. Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, that that's actually a really good segue into, um, into another question I had for you, which, so one really striking thing about, about this book, um, especially having read the series, you know, as I mentioned when it came out, is um, how the book expands both it expands temporally um, into the past um, and of course into the future but this 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 history isn't just this like adornment <laughs> to the narrative it's not just a way of thickening thickening the story um, uh, the 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 family history that you're able to excavate 
um, gives the book, um, from the very beginning of the book, um, this extremely haunting, recursive quality. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we learn, for instance, at the beginning that the shelter where at Auburn, the, the shelter where Dasani and her family are living, is the very place where her grandmother, uh, Joni, was born back when it was a hospital. Um, uh, or there's the moment when Chanel and Supreme um, are uh, meeting with Child Protective Services, and we learn that this is the same office where Supreme, uh, Dasani's father, um, stepfather um, himself was processed as a boy. Um, sometimes this history has the effect of, of showing the many contingencies that led to this family circumstances, um, all of the ways that it didn't have to be this way, um, all the ways that you know this tiny shift in another direction had Brooklyn not been redlined in the way it was, had jobs been um, you know, union jobs been available to Dasani's, I believe, great grandfather. Um, she may not be living in the shelter at this at this moment. Um, so at, we see at once like the contingencies, and also weirdly, we we there are times that this history creates a sense of inevitability um, of of a cycle continuing unabated, uninterrupted, and this kind of repetition. This. We're, we're back in the same place where this previous generation was. Um, so I guess my question is like, at what point did it become clear to you that this history, this deep, deep history would need to be a central part of the book's narrative? And more importantly, how has widening this historical lens in the way you've done here, how, how has widening the lens given you a perception of poverty that you might not have had otherwise. Maybe even a perception that wasn't there in the original series. I, would, I love this question. Um, I would start by saying that family is the universe of the book. Dasani is the protagonist, but family is the broader universe of her, of her life. And it's not just her present family it is what I would call the spirits of her past family, which are living very, very, very much inside her every day. She's talking constantly about Joni who died when she was in her fifties, tragically young, that was her grandmother. And then I would hear these stories about June Sykes, her great grandfather. And in the beginning they were vague. They were um, things like, you know, he drank a lot and then he would tell these crazy stories about seeing heads roll and the war and the war. And I kept hearing about the war. And in Dasani's immediate family, no one really knew the story. And so with their help, and, you know, we got more than 14,000 records at the end of the day, um, just this massive trove in part because to be poor is to be monitored. And mm -hmm. there is a very long paper trail. Mm -hmm. But um, in that trove were his veterans affairs. He finally got his file. I think it took eight months. And there I unearthed with the family and we were stunned to see it. It was just in this, this extraordinary history that this guy, June, short for junior, who'd been born in Goldsboro, North Carolina in 1920, his own great grandfather had been born enslaved. So I, with the help of a genealogist, went back through history to kind of just, because I think so much of the story isn't that necessarily small things could have made a big difference. I think that there is a huge story of racism that yeah. this yeah. story, that this family, and I, I know you know this, like encountered in such, it, the barriers were so overwhelming mm -hmm. to transcending the working class because of these racist structures. And you can really see that story with him. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because Dasani, actually more Chanel and Supreme, her parents were always talking to me, always, almost every day about slavery mm -hmm. and about the history of slavery. And this is way before it became a more central and necessary part, I would argue, of course, of American public discourse. This was way before George Floyd was the, in the very beginning. It was, it was, and I, um, I just felt that the history was so, this history was so alive in them and so much a part of our conversation. And, and, 
and, and you know, noticing the street names in Brooklyn that were names of families that had been involved in this in as enslavers, you know, had enslaved people in Brooklyn. I mean, that that was so going back to June, you know, he's born in 1920. He finds his way out of Goldsboro um, by joining the military at the height of World War II. He is a Buffalo soldier. So this is when it was still segregated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and leaves Jim Crow South to mm -hmm. go abroad mm -hmm. as part of this all black regiment. Mm -hmm. The first infantry, the only in infantry, the 92nd infantry, and his was the 30, 370th combat regiment, the first to land in Europe, the only infantry to fight in Europe, all black infantry. Mm -hmm. And he survived three battles. He helped um, liberate two Italian towns. He returned with three bronze uh, service stars and two medals back into having fought fascism and Nazi totalitarianism abroad, returns to a place where you can't get a mortgage if you're Black, where you don't get to go to college, where even if you are a veteran who has survived with all of these accolades, you are denied the very GI Bill supports that lifted millions of white veterans mm -hmm. into the middle class mm -hmm. and is largely credited with creating the middle class mm -hmm. and you see this in the 50s so june is stuck renting he winds up in the um housing projects that dasani would come to to call the projects right but this was in the beginning a different kind of fort green and um by the time that dasani is born in that shelter which was the hospital where her grandmother was born white wealth has returned to the mm -hmm. neighborhood Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm so interested also in your work, Brian, because you've looked at some of these same trends in places like Salinas, mm -hmm. where, you know, homelessness is suddenly skyrocketing, but at the same time that wealthier people are coming in and driving up rents, oh, uh, yeah. wages are stagnant. Yeah. And the outsider could look at Dasani in that moment in time, 2012, Bloomberg's been in office now, he's nearing the end of his third term. Homelessness has jumped up by 80% in the city in that period. Mm -hmm. And you'd see her as this random transplant into this shelter in Fort Greene, yeah. when actually, actually, the homeless girl has a birthright, a claim mm -hmm. historically to this neighborhood For that sure. is deeper, goes four, four generations back than almost anyone I've met in Fort Greene. Yeah, yeah. And yet she's there because she just happens to be there at the shelter, but she's she's there in terms of history. She's there, she's walking through the playgrounds and going to the same Walt Whitman Library that her grandmother went mm -hmm. to and played double mm -hmm. Dutch in, the same mm -hmm. streets running, the same way that Joni ran, um, you know, doing races and trying to figure out if she had the goods to to get out because um the escape narrative is another big part of what I examine, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I don't, don't do it um, in a forthright manner in this book, but I feel like Dasani's story challenges that narrative of the escape from poverty that we seem to venerate so often um, that, you know, we love that one kid who made it out by virtue of talent or athleticism or yeah. willpower or, you know, uh, you know, some kind of stroke of luck. And that is so often the story that um, that we celebrate. And I think part of that is about the fact that it, it lets everyone off the hook. It sort of says like, well, if you have enough talent or willpower, you can do it. Yeah. And therefore we're going to focus on this one child who made it out versus all these other children, thousands of others who are just as capable, just as willing. But once yeah. you start to look at why they didn't get out, you're forced to reckon with the barriers that are so much greater than any one child's potential. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, Dasani would struggle with this because she she also, of course, was the recipient of that narrative of like, maybe if you're if you become like an amazing runner, mm -hmm. you know, you'll get discovered. You'll you know, mm -hmm. a coach will find you and rescue you. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's rap. Maybe it's you know, it's these limited paths out. And I think by the time the book ends, which is this year, by the way, it ends in, in 2020, mm -hmm. which tells you how hard it was to end it. I finally just had to hit send. But, you know, she's now in a place where she's trying to reconcile these two opposite forces. One is you love your family, you're loyal to your family, your family's everything. And the other is 
don't you need to reach past them to get to something better? And I think her answer is, I want both. I don't want to have to leave. I don't want to have to escape. I want to thrive here in my, in my home. What if, even if I'm homeless, it's home. And she is more at home in New York than most people I know, you know, I want to make it work in this setting and in this context and not having to sound a different way, dress a different way, behave Mm -hmm. a different way, which was much of the message she got when she briefly tried to leave by going to this boarding school in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Didn't work. Yeah. I just that I I think one of the strongest rejoinders to the escape from poverty sort of narrative, which which I'm sure was totally, you know, wrapped up in the reception of the original series. It was the expectation that Dasani would now be this, uh, this exemplar of, you know, th- this kind of symbol of an escape from poverty. One of the, the moments in the book um, where I think it, that is just really, um, in a very subtle way, um, uh, dismantled is when Miss Hester, Dasani's, um, D- Dasani's teacher, uh, who herself has kind of stood as this kind of escape from the projects um, that this kind of story, I mean, in, in part, a story that she herself has, has um, created and, and perpetuated. And I think that's a really complicated question too, is how much of that narrative is also built into the kind of, you know, into the school, into what the kind of, what Miss Holmes, the kind of message that she was giving, which isn't, at all like a bad narrative it's it, it it's just there and i think it's something that there's something many, very, many yeah, yeah. there it's something very american it's very um but in any case miss hester um herself who the children look at as this um um as you know she if she could do it we could do it right um, she ends up getting evicted and she's going to homeless services and that moment was just, I mean, it was just absolutely crushing, but also so important because it, it serves to, um, it, it serves to just show how utterly pervasive this is. And also how, like you said, these aren't small little, you know, historical forces that are stacked against these lives. These are gigantic forces. These are, um, I mean, yeah, what what stood behind that moment of Miss Hester getting evicted is an entire universe of of injustice, of of, of property being placed before human lives, and so I, yeah. I was, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. I haven't talked about this yet, and there's so much to talk about, and so it's you know, uh, I I'm I'm just grateful that you brought this up. I was there the day she was evicted, mm. and yes, it was absolutely crushing. Um, It was not a story that Faith felt ready to share for a long time. And so it was not in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, She was in the book. She's an incredible beacon. Um, At the very, very end of this process, I went back to her and showed her the book. And I, I said, this is entirely, of course, your decision, but if your story becomes a part of this narrative, it becomes a lot harder to simply dismiss Dasani's population as the unworthy poor. Because if it can happen to you, oh my God, it can happen to anyone. Mm, mm. And she sat with that for a while and she decided to very bravely allow this to be included. And she's been an incredible advocate for the story and and been speaking at some events and stuff and she's just she's a remarkable human being she seems amazing yeah i just i remember that there's a scene in in the book where dasani and aviana return from their umpteenth shelter i think it's the eighth shelter they lived in at Mm -hmm. that point to all commuting because so chronic absenteeism is, is is a common fact um among the homeless right among homeless children uh, their commutes are crazy. And they were commuting from the Bronx at that point, going back and they uh, to Brooklyn and they reported to school that first day in 2014. And what you don't know in that scene, you see Miss Hester in that scene dressed in her most professional outfit and holding forth and telling her students, I need you here. Here is where, you, this is home now, this mm-hmm. classroom, because it is, it, it was a, at least a parallel home 
for so many of her students, mm -hmm. but you don't know that she's actually just, a, she's just commuted from her shelter that morning. It's, uh, and, and a third of, of parents in the shelter system in New York City, which mm -hmm. is hovering around 50,000 right now, the main shelter system, are working. Yeah. And you said this in uh, one of your stories that you've written about homelessness, mm -hmm. that the, um, the phrase, the working homeless, you, you believe this will become common, uh, you know, a kind of, mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree. I think that there sh that should be an, a, a label that we, that we, we broaden the label to that because yeah. we're going to use labels. That's a very accurate, accurate one to describe mm -hmm. the state of homelessness today. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I see we're, um, we're getting close to um, the point where, where we'll start to take questions. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to combine two questions. So, um, so there, there are many sentences in this book that hit me in just a totally visceral way. Um, uh, but one in particular stands out and it seems to capture something essential about the book. Um, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about this sentence. Um, the line comes about three quarters of the way through the book. Um, as Chanel, um, Dasani's mom, is going to stay at a shelter after the judge bars her from being with her kids and her husband. Um, and this is a single women's shelter, but the women living there, as you write, are not single so much as severed. <laughs> They're not single so much as severed. That, that line just seems to capture so much about what this book is ultimately a portrait of. It's a portrait of, as you said earlier, to be to be poor is to be surveilled. Um, it's to be monitored. Um, to be poor, as this book shows us, is also to be severed. It's to be, it's to be pulled apart. And as the book goes on after that that scene, um, the there's no other word for it. The 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 sort of stunning violence of the children being taken away from Supreme and Chanel. And um, in, uh, in the, the sur surrounding context of that is it's made clear to the reader that, that this is nothing but an injustice. Um, this is a, an indictment of ACS, the Administration for Children's Services. Um, um, and you talk about how, you know, Bill Clinton's role in passing the crime bill um, is, is often given you know, all the attention. Um, what isn't given attention is, is his role in passing the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which is, is part of what allows this violence to take place. Um, and, and I'm using the word violence, that's not your word, so I don't want to impose that on you. I guess two questions here um, to combine you know, two different registers, one about kind of the reporting process um, and the other, you know, about what the book is doing on a more kind of argumentative or, or um, conceptual level, you know, in terms of policy. But first, you know, what what was it like for you, Andrea, to to be there in real time witnessing this incredibly traumatizing moment up close? Um, uh, I'm so glad yeah. you asked. Yeah, yeah. and yes. and then the other question is just like. Like ACS, um, I mean, is yeah, maybe that, maybe that it's just like uh, I, that was definitely a moment where it's just like, what the fuck? Like this is just <laughs> straight up evil. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if that was an effect that was intended, and whether yeah. So those two kinds of questions: one about that sort of severing, and the just what it was like to witness this up close. So I want to just start by saying um, ACS, like all of these other systems, are human constructs. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, people who work at ACS who make damaging decisions, and there are people who work at ACS who make heroic decisions. It just so depends. It's, it goes down when we talk about contingencies and whims. They're on the front lines the whims, it's also true with welfare, you know, HRA. I mean, mm -hmm. the people who are inter interfacing with the Saudi's family on a daily basis 
are truly the people who need to be, I think, involved in making any kind of policy changes mm -hmm. as part of the conversation. They wield tremendous power and they also have incredible amounts of insight. The system, it, there is definitely the book takes a very hard look at what ACS is more broadly a part of. So what, what ACS, which is New York City's Child Protection Agency, can't control is the fact that it relies so heavily on federal funds and the federal government gives 10 times as much to programs that separate families, the vast majority of them black and brown, than mm -hmm. to keeping families together. So right there, you know, there, you know, this is part of a broader conversation about where we spend our funds. And mm -hmm. the truth is that I am struck most by the fact that Dasani's siblings, her family was her ultimate system of survival, right? Mm -hmm. This was the central thing that kept, that made life okay. And it was through this system of family and sibling bonds that they were able to navigate these other systems that were externally imposed upon them or that they signed up for in a sense by accepting benefits, even though this is also a family that refused certain benefits like many poor families. And that's another assumption that I think people have that's incorrect, that poor people don't want to work. First of all, they're working every day. They're just not working in the way that the labor, uh, formal labor, mar labor market yeah. um, acknowledges as work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but getting back to, you know, this is a family that the children were removed from their home. Just that act, as we know from looking at what happened to migrant children on the border and mm -hmm. all of our attention of late, looking at the trauma of separation is definitive. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a huge step to, to make. And, and when you're disrupting a family, this is the consequence. Yeah. Um, they went from their home into a foster care system that wound up spending on average about $33,000 a month on this family alone, just on these eight children. Wow. And if you would taken, I'm just, it's interesting because like if you took, a, and actually the person who pointed this out to me was one of the caseworkers um, who to my mind is, emerges as one of the small heroes in this book, Linda Lowe. She was working for Foundling, the prevention service. And she said, look, if you took just a fraction of that amount and put someone in the home, like the visiting nurse help program, which has, you know, we know it has incredible results just to help, you know, what, what Chanel and Supreme needed, I do believe is not parenting classes. They didn't need parenting classes. Uh, they needed someone to work the phones. Mm -hmm. They needed maybe a lawyer or a legal aid yeah. assistant or somebody who could help them get their um, the conditions of their homes, you know, the, the problems, the leak fixed. And um, their children were removed on neglect allegations. The vast majority in New York City, 93% of families face only neglect charges. Mm -hmm. Neglect is different. You know, there's two forms of child maltreatment, abuse and neglect. Abuse, which is 2% abuse only, by the way, of these cases that year, or 2%, mm -hmm. is about inflicting physical harm. It's about I think it's about intentionality. Neglect is failure, is failure to provide shelter, is failure to provide adequate clothing or food or to get your kid to school on time. And, and these are, you know, the problems of poverty. Yeah. And so there is a case to be made that fam poor families are being um, policed. Mm -hmm. And uh, to go back, so I sort of answered the second question first. I was, um, I was texting with my dear friend, Casey Parks, who now writes for the Washington Post. She's, I think she's with us today. I was just texting with her this morning about, um, you know, she and I both do a lot of listening to music to get us through stuff or sometimes to just- She made me it. an amazing mix CD or mix, not oh, CD, yeah. but mix. If you're yeah. on, <laughs> if, you, if you get to receive one of Casey Parks's, now she's going to be bombarded playlists. You are very lucky. Yes. And I was just sharing with her this morning, we were talking about, you know, stuff and uh, it's not something I've really said yet to anyone, but, you know, that day that I, I was there the day that uh, Lily, the baby was removed mm -hmm. from her father and, um, and all the kids, um, but I didn't see those removals. I saw hers 
And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to ever make the narrative around this book about me or mm -hmm. what it was like for me. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really just, I want to spend every second I can of every platform talking about them and mm -hmm. what it was like to be them or what their story is. But I will just say that, I mean, I listened to Purple Rain on repeat for three weeks after that to the point where my own children were like, okay, she's gone nuts. Like, can we listen to something else, please? Mm -hmm. Just this song again and again and again and again. I don't even know how to describe what that was, mm -hmm. how that impacted me, except to say that it changed me completely mm -hmm. as a human. And I think, I think that as when we're reporting these stories, we're very hard on ourselves, journalists and also ethnographers. There's this sense that you have to kind of like keep your humanity in check mm -hmm. and you're there to do your work. And if you somehow allow all this overwhelming stuff in mm -hmm. that you're somehow gonna do less of a good job. And I actually think it's the opposite. I think there's a close relationship between powerful writing and empathy yeah. and that doesn't mean you're biased mm -hmm. i think the closer you get to your subjects the more work you have to do in the editing room mm -hmm. to make sure you know and show it to a lot of people and have them push back at you and question yourself but that feeling those raw kind of emotions mm -hmm. that inform us as humans because we can't help but be our our human selves can then actually make the writing sort of more present for the reader i think yeah. and it's 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 just the fact i mean i learned i think over time to just create space for these two things to be true that i'm there as a reporter and that i am there as a human being mm -hmm. and it was complicated it was always complicated and it's not something i feel like i've figured out entirely it's something i'm always wrestling with but I also think that is part of the answer is to just never get completely comfortable with that, that tension and to just, just to see it and to keep thinking about it and talking about it even with your, with your subjects. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually, so um, one of the questions that has come up um, from the audience um, is uh, from Kevin Sack, who's a former New America fellow. Hi, um, Kevin. New York You're Times favorite. colleague. Oh, um, and um, his question very much um, flows from what we were just talking about. He, uh, he says, um, reporter intrusion becomes a challenge when you embed for a decade. How did your presence shape events and how did you handle that journalistically? And I guess like just, yeah, to, I know you've, you've been talking about that already, but um, in, you know, there are parts in the book like where Dasani came to stay at your apartment when, when people were out to kill her, um, um, when when a, riot, a gang was was threatening to murder her, and so she comes and stays at your place. Um, that's a very clear and and you don't make uh, you don't hide that in the book. It's just that yeah. the reader is made aware that there's a chance that she would have been killed had she not come to stay with you, um, and and yet there are other moments like we were you know, just describing with the children being taken away where, where it seems that that events are allowed to take place. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think Kevin is asking um, a, a broader question just about, you know, how does your presence, you know, shape the flow of things, but, um, but maybe we could even make it more particular about, you know, these kinds of moments, how did you know this is a time that I need to, I need to stop this from happening, or this is a time when I, I have to just kind of allow things to take their course because otherwise it won't, I will no longer be observing or documenting re reality. I will be right. directly shaping the reality. Um, I think part of the, the reason that I was able to observe so much and take a back seat was that I knew the family was being so carefully monitored. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like my, my role was 
to watch the monitoring. Like if, if nobody was around, I, you know, I'm trying to think of an example where I had to, I had to cross that line. I think the line for me usually was around food. And if I saw abject hunger mm -hmm. and with the children, I felt like I had to give them something to eat. And I did that. Mm -hmm. I would bring groceries sometimes, or, you know, at the times we uh, had this policy where we take our sources out to eat. And when I was re reporting that initial story, I felt like, why aren't, why aren't we going out to eat? Like we should be going to these nice restaurants that I know city hall reporters take their sources. Mm -hmm. And so I did that once mm -hmm. I went with Chanel to this fancy restaurant on the New York times. She kept complaining about the bill and like how I could spend 50, like $15 for a hamburger. Come on, Jerry, I could do this. I could do that. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, I think there's two, there's three major things I want to say about this. One is that the night that Dasani came to stay with me is a perfect example. I think like my rule of thumb is if I did do something that had a kind of cause and effect, I would write about it. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. I mean, I couldn't not do that for her. Mm -hmm. She needed a safe haven. Um, she left the next day, but where I encountered a real sort of struggle was when I was visiting her at Hershey, that was before this happened, mm -hmm. after her mother uh, had lost custody of her and she was now in the custody of Dasani of ACS. And mm -hmm. there was a court order preventing Chanel from visiting Dasani. And Chanel understandably felt really upset that I got to see her daughter, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. And that was a time when I had to say, I know you wanna come with me. I know it would be easy for you to jump in my car we could probably get away with taking Dasani to a diner, mm. but I would be violating a court order and mm. I can't do that. Yeah. And that was a crisis moment for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It ended up getting remedied because the agency monitoring Chanel's parents, parenting and supervising her visits mm -hmm. arranged for a visit with her and Dasani. But mm -hmm. there, there are lines, you know, I also want to say that I'm very reluctant to take credit for the things that happened for Dasani. For example, you know, she was discovered by this fitness guru giant. I wasn't there. That was one of the very few instances in which, actually I was there early that day with the family at this event. I left before this scene where she meets giant mm -hmm. and I had both giant and Dasani and Chanel and everyone around me, you know, reconstruct that mm -hmm. to the best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. But People wondered later in the series, you know, like she got this great break. Is it because mm -hmm. he knew mm -hmm. that you were there? No, he saw this kid was incredibly talented. Yeah. Um, did Hershey let Dasani in because they saw kind of media opportunity? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of the school. This was entirely her principal's idea. Yes, though, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Did that take from what actually happened? Or, you know, I mean, I think to the extent that we can acknowledge our role and keep ourselves in the story without centering it on us in any way. I think that's really important. I think that the biggest takeaway for me about how my presence in their life may or may not have impacted the story was in the conversations I would have with Chanel over the years in which I would say to her things like, I am the author of this book, but you are the author of your life. Whatever you do next, I'm going to be writing about. She knew that. Did that impact her decision-making? It may have. Did it cause her to choose more wisely or, or to not do things that she wanted to do? It's possible. Mm -hmm. um, only she can speak to that. Mm -hmm. The family was very, very, very prepared for the book by the time it came out. I actually mm -hmm. spent five days reading it to Dasani and Aviana mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to see their faces. And I also wanted them to ask me about any words that didn't make sense and some of the policy stuff or whatever it is. Or, and also to just check for issues of tone and accuracy and to really feel like this was, and by the time we did that, 
you know, the scenes in which Dasani got so tired of me saying, what were you thinking in that moment? Because I wanted to be able to get inside her head as much as possible, which mm-hmm. is an impossible thing to do mm-hmm. without a deep interaction with your subject, right? Where you're mm-hmm. constantly, you know, writing something down, reading it to them. Does this sound right? What doesn't sound right? There were parts of the book, nothing in this book did this family ask me to take out. Mm-hmm. It was extraordinary. And Chanel said mm-hmm. to me, there are two very funny things that happened. One was when Chanel said to me, being reported on by you is a little bit like having an autopsy done when you're still alive. <laughs> like every part of my being is being examined. <laughs> I mean, she was, I don't know. And, we, and how she said, many of us could like withstand that kind of scrutiny I mean, ourselves? Absolutely. I, mean, yeah, yeah. I would never be able, and to Sunny, uh, at the end of the five days, when we got to the last line, she said, this is the last line. And I said, yes. And she jumped on top of my dining room table and started dancing. And it's not because she liked the ending. I mean, she was fine with the last um, line, but she was just mm-hmm. so relieved that it was <laughs> over. I will just say, Aden Relay Ojo, who is this incredible narrator, is the audible voice of the book. And she's exquisite. And it's such a joy to hear her, to hear these words in, 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 in her voice mm. uh i do not possess those talents i think Dasani was just like so sick of it by the end mm-hmm. but um yeah i think they were prepared and they they knew what this book was but they got to read it so that was really important um so uh with the five minutes we have left um uh they wanted to try to combine um a couple of these questions and you could just kind of um uh, decide what to take up. Um, so uh, Sarita asks about, you know, if, if there's one message that you hope endures after readers encounter this book, um, what, what would that be? Um, someone asks, um, an anonymous attendee asks, um, will you continue to stay in touch with Dasani? Um, uh, and I would just ask, you know, you've, you've now spent nine years, um, eight years, nine years with this family, with Dasani, this, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, this is more than just an act of reporting or an act of journalism. I mean, this is uh, not to be sentimental about it, but it, it, it's clearly an act of love. It's an act of, of witnessing. It's an act of, of presence. How are you feeling now to have this out in the world? Um, so and yeah, what, what is that like um, to be talking about Chanel and Supreme and Desi- I, I know there's a risk of them becoming these abstracted characters and not the flesh and blood people that you presumably, I, I, I assume you will continue to stay in touch with them. Oh um, yeah. Just what, so what, what, what is this like for you right now? So any of those questions and I'll just kind of let you, let you take that. I mean, I, I talk to them every day. Um, they remain uh, very embedded in my life just as I embedded in theirs. And um, I don't want that to be a relationship that ends. Um, the reporting relationship is over. I think uh, Dasani, Dasani deserves a break from being written about at this point. Um, she, she's relieved to have a segue into just a clear friendship versus my role being these two hats that you wear where you're the human and you're also the reporter and you're somebody who has big feelings of caring and of um, admiration and also of sadness at times for that person, but also that those things are in service of a story that she very much cared about getting out there. The fact that that is behind us is is kind of a relief, I think. Um, I but I very much hope to stay in their lives. Um, I don't even hope, I, I know we will. I, I do believe we will. Um, I think that the big takeaway for me is that you can't really read Dasani's story and continue to hold on to these blanket assumptions that people make about the poor. Uh, I think she forces a reckoning with those assumptions. Um, Family 
is everything to all of us. This is a universal story. I mean, that's another thing I will say. It's a story that has, it's a family saga. We all have families. Mary Carr once said that the definition of a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one member. Anyone can read this book and relate. Um, part of the thing that bonded Dasani and I very early on was when she would hear me, you know, bickering with my mother in Spanish on the phone. And she loved that we, we were, you know, that I had a mother from Chile and that she had a father, biological father, who was half Dominican. And that was like a point of connection. But it was also just the fact that she could see that I could get really annoyed and eye rolly with my mom. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and that sort of the two way street of reporting and the sort of revealing of yourself is I think so important to a project like this. Um, by that same token, I think I want people to take away from the book that, you know, at the, at the sort of like heart of this story is, is this family that when we talk about the cycle of poverty, we're forgetting about the cycle of power mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is so central to this family. Mm -hmm, there are many positive cycles here mm -hmm, of resilience, of survival. Mm -hmm. um, and also just can people begin to challenge their traditional notion of what it means to be happy, of what it means to be successful? Mm -hmm. um, why do we impose upon a kid like Dasani this expectation mm -hmm. that she must leave the community in order to attain attain those things rather than focusing on fixing the things in those communities that make thriving in just simple financial terms or in terms of health possible yeah. um and so i i i think that it's that and i think at the end of the day if this book is about anything you know when you when you when you really think about what it's about the, all the themes that fall under this rubric of poverty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you know, things like homelessness, things like educational attainment, uh, chronic unemployment, uh, unemployment, um, drug addiction, which by the way, cuts across class and race in America, as we well know now, but as a form of self-medication, gentrification, all of those things, I would, I would say this, I would say that this book is about belonging and it's about more specifically who gets to belong to a place and who mm -hmm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope people will take from it. Yeah, but I'm yeah. really, really interested in hearing everything that it brings up in people because mm -hmm. that's, that's the sort of afterlife of the book writing process is seeing what things you weren't even aware of that the book inspired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Andrea, thank you for the gift of, of this book. Um, thank you for the gift of of making clear the work that remains to be done, that the story is still being written and that everyone who encounters the story has now a responsibility and is now going to be held accountable to how the story continues to be written. Um, and, um, and that's definitely something that, that I, as a reader, took away from this. Um, thank you. Thank you for um, the gift of this conversation as well. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who um, joined us um, and everyone take care.